As you know, this lecture is part of, uh, as Bunhui just told us, a set of events on India, which includes an exhibition um, uh, that I'm very eager to see after this lecture uh, on the Bombay progressives. Now, these figures, these artists, uh, represent what one might see as the heroic period of Indian secularism, um, which is to say the period that immediately follows upon independence, and independence that, let us remember, was achieved after a violent partition uh, of British India uh, on religious or apparently religious grounds. Uh, this heroic period, what I'm calling the heroic period of Indian secularism, is one that is characterized uh, uh, by uh, what the Indian Prime Minister of the time, Nehru, called uh, a scientific temper. And yet, when you look at the art, um, its engagement with religion is fulsome, to put it mildly. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, the great uh, you know, philosophical but also political text um, of ancient times, which received a kind of modern incarnation in the 19th, in the, in the 19th century, uh, is very much a subject of much of this art, as is the battlefield of uh, Karbala uh, and the martyrdom of Imam Hussein in the Muslim tradition, uh, as also the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, all of these events or these subjects, of course, are deeply violent in their own way, uh, but their violence is attuned to the idea of justice, whether it's the battlefield of the Bhagavad Gita or the battlefield of Karbala or Calvary, indeed, uh, uh, and the crucifixion of Jesus. So how can we actually think about this, what I'm calling this fulsome engagement with religion in ostensibly secular Indian art? All of these artists are considered emblematic of Indian secularism or of its heroic period, as I'm uh, naming it. I think one of the things one might um, take away from this engagement, which is interesting because very few, if any, of these pieces of art classify or can count as religious art. Uh, you know, they're not likely to be hung up in churches or temples, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and yet, they are unashamedly engrossed with, I might say, uh, religious themes. And not simply because religion appears to be one of the great, as it were, uh, late motifs, light motifs of Indian society. Um, one of the things I'd like to suggest about this art and its relationship with religion is that it's, how should I put it, an indifferent relationship. There is no dualistic um, uh, relation posited between religion and non-religion. Um, the relationship is indifferent insofar as it uh, 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 it may be characterized uh, by what the Indian political uh, theorist Rajya Bhargava calls the category of, of uh, principal distance, um, that the issue is not drawing a line that demarcates what is religion from what is non-religion, but rather um, uh, thinking about the way in which the state or other putatively secular bodies can engage with what is called religion or what they define as religion in a rather shifting way, whose only principle is that of um, uh, equity. So if the state or any other body that defines itself as secular deals with Hinduism or Hindu institutions in one way, it must also deal with Muslim, Christian, Jain, Sikh, etc. Uh, institutions in the same way. Whether or not this actually happened is another question, uh, but what I'm focused on is what I'm calling this indifferent relationship that there is a non-dualistic relationship between religion and non-religion. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because um, I think it allows us to think about what we have been since the 1980s, or at least since the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, what we're used to thinking about as the return of religion in the West, right? and not only in the West. So throughout the 80s, you have a whole series of um, academic and journalistic and indeed aesthetic and cultural responses to what was seen as the return of religion to public life. Um, and consequently, the crisis of secularism. There are books called The Crisis of Secularism in India, for instance. Now, in the early years of the 1980s, um, this was an equal opportunity field. So if you think of Martin Marty at the University of Chicago and his 
sort of immense fundamentalisms project, uh, all those scholars involved in that project were thinking of uh, every kind of religion, and they were interested in the way in which what they call fundamentalism, itself a term that was put into question in this project, uh, appeared to arise in the 1980s uh, in a way that did not distinguish between one religion and the other. So you could talk about fundamentalism in every religion. Uh, but of course, in more recent times, it is Islam particularly that has come to represent the so-called return of religion, certainly in the West, but also in other places. Now, when Islam comes to adopt this position, it defines the other religions negatively. It either secularizes them, you know, so you can think of other religions as being, in a way, slightly more secular for whatever reason, whether intrinsically or due to historical circumstance, um, um, than Islam, or it sort of spurs a, a kind of strange, if you will, penis envy of Islam. Uh, so you have, you know, um, these movements like Christian Jihad in this country, right? Which doesn't mean killing people, but it means, you know, we we, we really need to take uh, what is um, uh, what appears in Islam to be. Um, the, uh, the strength of the religious impulse and try to replicate it. Right? Today in India, for instance, there are organizations such as the Sanatan Sansta, which um, appear to be trying to replicate uh, what they imagine to be Islamic ideas of uh, uh, legal uh, subjecthood. Right? So trying to turn what might have been described as a ritualistic, um, uh, uh, the ritualistic character of Hinduism into a legally defined, you know, so Hinduism too must have its sharia, it must have law, etc. So there are two ways in which the dominance of Islam, um, as, you know, uh, representing religion in its strongest form, um, has led to the either secularization of other religions or their, as it were, envious attempt to uh, replicate something of what they think Islam means. Yet this return uh, of religion and particularly of Islam, I want to argue, is entirely stereotyped. It indeed is backward looking in the same way that um, uh, secularists often argue religion or fundamentalism is backward looking because, and you will know this, um, uh, whether you look at the newspapers or listen to the radio or television, um, the return of religion is very often spoken of uh, by those who purport to be speaking in the name of secularism in terms of the history of the European past. So did Islam have a reformation, or should it have a reformation? What about the Enlightenment? Now, these historical instances of the European past, of course, are not, how should I say, true to history. Uh, so you know, if you were to take a paragon of the Enlightenment like Voltaire, uh, you know, you'd be hard pressed to argue that Voltaire would have recognized the Reformation, surely a great instance of re religious upheaval, as being somehow connected to the Enlightenment and secularism later on. So I tend to think that the strangely backward-looking character of this, um, uh, uh, this narrative about the return of religion um, itself requires investigation. Um, there's something odd and uh, indeed wrong about it. But let me leave that aside for the moment um, and go on to what the critics of secularism say. So if, if um, some uh, secularists um, uh, might argue that religion has returned in this awful way, and that we need to think about it in terms of the history of Europe, as if that should be replicated everywhere in the world, um, the critics of secularism often um, uh, think about it uh, as a colonial imposition. I'm being very crude here, uh, but the books are there for you to read should you want to. Um, that you know, secularism is a creation of Europe. It goes abroad in the colonial enterprise. Indeed, it is created in many ways in the colonial enterprise. Um, and it is a way, it is a category that allows rulers to divide and rule subjects, uh, right? Um, and that this form of controlling societies and classifying and defining them in various ways where the religious um, phenomenon has to be controlled, managed, and kept out of power um, is inherited by post-colonial regimes, right? This, in, in a very crude way, seems to be one of the arguments that the critics of secularism make. They also say, very interestingly, uh, and no doubt correctly, that the category religion itself is a creation, if you will, of secularism. Right? That you can't have one without the other. Now, what I would like to suggest here is that 
what might be important is not the return of religion. I've, ca- I've tried to cast aspersions upon that narrative. Uh, but rather, it's vanishing. What if the so-called crisis of secularism is not about the return of religion, but it's about the vanishing of religion um, uh, from uh, the category secular itself? And let me say something about what I mean here. Now, one way in which the supposedly incommensurable relationship between the secular and the religious, or the religious and the non-religious, is disturbed in our own day is by the emergence of diversity uh, as a term that belongs, shall we say, in, um, uh, in a context uh, of market difference or market differentiation. Suddenly, that singular, incommensurable relationship, religion, non-religion, or religion, secular, seems to have been lost uh, in the din of diversity, the language of diversity. Right? Um, how can we recover what is religious and what is non-religious, the incommensurable relationship in the diversity of market differentiation? Um, and I mention this uh, in order to introduce a book by my Oxford colleague, um, Cecile Laborde, called Liberalism's Religion, a recent book, in which she argues for the disaggregation of religion itself as a category in liberal thought, right, and therefore in law. So she says, for instance, that... Um, um, very many principles, secular, if you will, principles, such as the freedom of conscience, have been um, uh, used as a precedent for other non-religious forms of political or cultural uh, identification or phenomena, right? So freedom of conscience is no longer confined to religion. Uh, it, it can be extended to many other kinds of groups, right? Similarly, other kinds of rights uh, of privacy and etc., which were formulated uh, for non-religious uh, um, uh, phenomena uh, now in Western liberal democracies um, uh, apply to religious groups as well. So she's arguing that it's become impossible to specify what is religious and what is non-religious, um, uh, or at least very difficult to do so. Uh, so her argument is that we need to disaggregate religion uh, and not treat it as this singular thing. But of course, by implication, she's also arguing that secularism is also uh, a form that can be disaggregated, that it doesn't exist on its own. Now, she doesn't um, go on to talk about uh, what I'm suggesting, that this, these forms of diversity have meaning and you know, are, are marketized forms. But I think it's very interesting, uh, her argument, um, uh, because it appears to show up this, the crisis of secularism or the return of religion as um, a product of the inability to make that incommensurable distinction or to specify the incommensurability of the distinction between what is religion and what is non-religion. Now, the Indian philosopher uh, Muhammad Iqbal wrote about this uh, as early as the 1920s. Um, He argues that what he describes as the liberal Western... um, Uh, form of conceiving of the secular relationship is in fact a metaphysical relationship. So the distinction, he says that the distinction between religion and non-religion is mapped on to the distinction between the public and the private. Uh, That religion, and this is I'm sure familiar to you all, it's a set of cliches in fact, that religion uh, should be confined to or has its home in the private sphere uh, of liberal societies and non-religion, economics, politics, etc., belong in the public uh, realm of those societies. Now, whether or not you can actually make that distinction is, is another question. Iqbal argues that you cannot really make the distinction. So he says this distinction of religion and non-religion mapped onto the private and the public is in fact a metaphysical distinction that it derives from what he names a Magian and then Christian form of thinking about the spiritual and the material. Right? That what is spiritual uh, receives its spatial coordinates, if you will, in medieval times in monasticism. This is his argument. I'm not making it as mine. I'm not saying it's historically true. But it's an interesting way of considering how others have thought about secularism and its, um, uh, if you will, contradictions. Um, 
that you have the spiritual confined to the private uh, and the material at home in the public and that the distinction between what is spiritual and what is material is a metaphysical distinction. It is not a functional distinction and it has a prehistory in religion itself. So that the secular distinction is itself, if you will, a metaphysical or a religious one. So like Marx, um, who actually makes a similar kind of argument in his famous essay on the Jewish question, um, in Europe, and that question, as you know, is about uh, you know, how can, with Jewish emancipation, how can you, uh, where does the Jewish religion belong? All right? And can you actually split people into public selves and private selves? So like Marx, who, whose work Iqbal knew, you know, he is um, uh, he's very um, leery of this distinction. Apart from saying that it is itself a metaphysical one, and therefore European, um, uh, one that cannot be expanded pell-mell into the rest of uh, the world, he actually goes on to make another kind of point. Uh, he says that when you separate out the spiritual and the material in this spatial way by mapping it onto the liberal distinction of private and public, what ends up happening is that you break the, you sever the link between what is ideal or non-instrumental or principled or spiritual indeed from what is material, public, uh, you know, et cetera. That the, that the realm of the public then is given over to completely instrumentalized relationships. Uh, you know, they might be cynical, um, uh, 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 they might not be cynical, but even if they are not, they are materialistic in the pejorative sense. Right? And that gets to be the realm of uh, capitalist transactions. And the problem with this is that the link with the spiritual, which doesn't necessarily mean religious, but means ideal or et cetera, non-instrumental, is broken. Right? He then goes on to trace the way in which he thinks this material or public world uh, comes to be embodied by the, and guaranteed by the nation state as itself a form of property. So the public world is a world of property and negotiations over property, transactions over property. The nation state is property writ large as the nation's property. Right? And, and uh, nationalism leads to various kinds of wars and violence and imperialism and all the rest. Uh, so his task then is to try to make a reconnection. Right? Um, and he might not have been very successful uh, with this, but he offers us a kind of way of thinking about alternatives. So one of the things he does, for instance, in his work is to ask, well, look, if this uh, European liberal conception of secularism is spatial, uh, and metaphysical, uh, how might we think of another kind of distinction that is temporal? What happens when we think about religion and non-religion in temporal terms, in terms of time rather than space? Space is impossible. You can't really bifurcate individuals, as Marx argued. Right? It's contradictory. Um, and he gives two examples of this um, uh, from Islam. Uh, one is the, uh, what he terms the Sunni uh, view which is that the death of Muhammad, the death of the prophet, means that there is no longer any authority, divine authority present in the world, and that means that the world is an imperfect world, but the imperfect world is also the realm of freedom, precisely because God and his authority have been rendered, have been left in the past. Right? Uh, and the other version of this is the Shiite version, in his view, uh, uh, where he says that the expectation of the Messiah, of the vanished Imam, of the 12th Imam, means that we live in an imperfect world, and it means that you could not, without being absolutely sacrilegious and blasphemous, seek to instantiate a religious order in the world today. So there, too, the imperfection of the world uh, becomes a ground for freedom, for human freedom, uh, which is what he's interested in. So again, I'm not making any claims for the historical veracity of this description, but what I'm suggesting is that Iqbal is here thinking about other ways in which to reconceive the relationship between what is religion and what is non-religion. In the cases he, he uh, describes, of course, um, though you may think of them as metaphysical, there is no distinction between, uh, no incommensurable distinction between what is religion and what is non-religion. In fact, what is non-religion uh, appears almost as a kind of um, um, esoteric reality right? uh, within the terminology of religion itself. That religion itself allows for um, 
human freedom by its self-limitation uh, in these two ways. Um, so having described, I hope in not too boring a way, Iqbal's um, uh, uh, argument about uh, liberal secularism uh, and his attempt to rethink it, uh, if only partially, I want to go on to suggest um, that if Islam appears to be the chief subject, if not culprit, of this narrative about the return of religion, um, it might be because of the fact that um, the absence or the vanishing of that incommensurability, of that incommensurable um, uh, relationship between what is religion and non-religion, um, has put the secular project into crisis. Um, that Islam seems to revive it. Uh, you know, we have lost it. Uh, as Cecile Laborde would argue, you can disaggregate religion, you can disaggregate secularism. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's diversity and market differentiation that seems to be happening here. So how do you return? How do you get the theological back? Because of surely this bifurcated metaphysical distinction that someone like Iqbal described requires it. Um, so, so the reason by the, the title of this lecture is Godless Secularism, of course, is the very fact of godlessness puts that form of secularism into crisis. So you need to like bring back theology somehow. And what better way to do it than Islam? Yet, this is rarely true. Um, uh, all the great controversies um, having to do with Islam, uh, from the initial one, the initial great global one in 1989, the Rushdie affair, you know, the um, the uh, protests against the, his novel, The Satanic Verses. Um, two more recent events. Uh, when you look at them more closely, what, what I find really fascinating about them is that the Muslim protesters themselves have difficulty in laying claim to the theological, in laying claim to the metaphysical, um, that they are constantly themselves being dragged into the liberal language uh, of, of the secular. And this is true even of the Rushdie affair, where the claims made uh, tend to be quite liberal, you know, inclusion, you know, this and that. Uh, but also the use of the term blasphemy, you know, to describe this book uh, is explicitly taken from the British law on bla blasphemy since abrogated uh, once Tony Blair became prime minister. So even there, even the resort to the theological by these Muslim protesters had to go to Western Christianity. You know, it couldn't actually utter its own name. Um, uh, and I find this uh, really quite curious. And it's not, this is not a one-off incident. Uh, my uh, friend, the anthropologist Navida Khan, uh, who teaches at Johns Hopkins, has written very nicely about the way in which the anti-Ahmadi laws in Pakistan, uh, you know, the Ahmadis are a, a, a sect or a group or a community of people who have been deemed to be uh, non-Muslim. And they are disbarred from using the name Muslim for themselves. And they are not allowed to call their places of worship mosques, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, uh, and Navida Khan argues very nicely, as I said, that when um, the Pakistani courts take up this issue, they do so by arguing that Islam is, they do so by relying upon no theological principles, but by relying upon copyright law, the law of copyrights and patents, by saying Islam belongs, of course, to its adherents, and here are these people uh, who claim to be Muslim, and, you know, clearly this is just, uh, you know, a, a, you know, these are fake goods. They're the peddling, and the problem they pose is they'll confuse the true, uh, you know, it's, uh, they'll confuse the true believers, and so you must put an end to it. So that entire process of what appears to be a highly theological argument, in fact, goes through utterly liberal and secular and indeed capitalist uh, uh, formulations. Um, similar things can be said about uh, uh, c more current issues in places like Southeast Asia, where there are controversies over the use of the name Allah, right? That Allah only belongs to Muslims, and Christians and others can't use it, though historically they have, because as they continue to do in the Middle East, because it simply means God. Uh, but Allah has been made into a kind of proper name, and more than that, has been made into the property of Muslims. Uh, you see how the, um, uh, the great controversies over Islam, in other words, tend to be structured around questions about property whether it's copyright and patent, whether it's problems of ownership, uh, um, 
And in all these ways, the theological element, which is meant to be uh, at the fore of these debates, actually is a constantly disappearing act, um, uh, which I find fascinating. Um, much of the arguments of Muslim protesters, uh, therefore, are based upon some version of, if you will, free market ideas. Right? And they seem to realize that um, uh, uh, free trade upon which free speech seems to be modeled, and I'm going back to my uh, uh, initial issue of diversity because it's in that context that diversity has meaning, um, uh, depends upon the realm of free trade, just like the realm of free speech, has limits. Right? And in, in terms of free trade, it might be contraband or drugs or arms or whatever. And in terms of free speech, it's libel and uh, defamation and uh, hate speech, et cetera. Right? And the Muslim protesters realize this, and they simply want their bit included in this diversity, this market of goods and ideas. Um, so where you really want the theological uh, category, it seems to disappear, um, which is why uh, a figure like the, the very important French writer Michel Houlebecq, who's written this interesting book called Submission, seen as being an Islamophobic book, right? a book that is about a France that comes to be controlled by Muslims. Right? Uh, when you read this book, what's fascinating about it that is there is a great deal of envy here because what these Muslims apparently represent is what we Europeans have lost. You know, they really have genuine certitude. They have this metaphysical certainty they have, therefore, the strength of their own conviction, and we no longer have that. All right? uh, so what uh, Ulebeck would like to do is recover that uh, for Europe. And in this uh, story, you find a narrative, uh, you find a kind of strange mirroring of colonial um, uh, uh, narratives, uh, where you have colonized peoples thinking that Europeans are, in fact, endowed with this certitude, this moral certitude, this metaphysical essence that, in fact, they need to. Um, uh, uh, recover from them if they are not to be wiped out entirely. So there's a nice circularity in, in these debates. And in all of it, I want to argue uh, the metaphysical which everyone wants, the theological which everyone is searching for, endlessly escapes. Uh, and that is the nature of what I'm calling the crisis of secularism. Now, to turn to India. In India, I want to argue secularism has never been about a metaphysical distinction between what is religious and what is non-religious. Uh, whether you look at its origins, its institutional origins, um, uh, or its current practice. Uh, so let's take, for instance, the um, Queen's Proclamation of 1858 as a notional point of origin, documentary origin of what we can call Indian secularism today. Right? So Queen Victoria in 1858 uh, released this proclamation in the aftermath of the Indian Mutiny, which was uh, a, a great war in which Hindus and Muslims united against the East India, the British East India Company. Um, and many of the uh, reasons given by the mutineers uh, for their rebellion had to do with inter British interference in their religious practices. So Queen Victoria's proclamation guarantees religious freedom and non-interference. So it seems like a perfectly secular document, and yet it's issued by a monarch who is, of course, the head of a church, the head of the Church of England, uh, and it's issued as an act of Christian charity, almost, if you were to read it. All right? So here is the great fundament of Indian secularism in legal terms, in modern legal terms. And you, know, you can't actually make, uh, you can't really release it, if you will, from the grasp of religion. Uh, so there, too, the relationship between religion and non-religion is not an incommensurable one. It's an indifferent one, as I, as I started out by saying. You might also look at the Indian Penal Code, um, you know, formulated also in this period in, around the second half of the 19th century, and one of its great authors, Lord Macaulay. Um, in the Indian Penal Code, Macaulay decided not to put in a blasphemy provision, right? So India doesn't have one. Uh, but instead, in a nice secular way, if you will, uh, to replace that provision with one that had to do with hurt feelings and sentiments, offense to native sentiments. And it's this provision that continues to define religious protest in India. They don't make use of theological categories generally. Uh, whatever the cause, uh, 
it's always these delicate emotions, or, you know, our hurt sentiments um, that are invoked. Um, so whether it is the ostensibly Christian uh, figure of the Queen's Proclamation or the ostensibly secular one of the Indian Penal Code, uh, the relationship of religion and non-religion seems to be an indifferent one uh, because um, uh, uh, even when religious violence occurs in India, it occurs, if you will, in the name of the secular um, uh, without theological categories. Uh, now, this becomes clear when you think about the fact that in contemporary India, um, everyone claims to be secular. It's a fascinating problem, actually. Uh, no group of people reject secularism. Everyone is secular. Now, you might understand why very pious and believing Muslims um, uh, would, as a minority group, rely upon secularism in India because it protects them. Uh, but even those who are called Hindu nationalists are, in their own estimation, which I believe, um, secular. Uh, there's almost nothing theological about it, uh, not simply in Christian or Western terms, but even indeed in their own terms. So whether it is controversies over temples or cows or it could be anything, they're all made in the name of majoritarianism, in the name of the those feelings and sentiments that Macaulay had written into the Indian Penal Code uh, of a large segment of India's population, indeed the largest segment of India's population. So a funny situation here, the most religious country, apart from the, these, the United States in the world, uh, and everyone is secular, everyone claims to be secular, uh, and indeed they are secular, as I'm arguing with uh, reference to Hindu nationalists. The contrast with neighboring Pakistan is stark, uh, where secularism has largely become a bad word. You know, to call someone a secularist is to insult them. In India, you would call someone, it's a nice new term, secular. Uh, sick, as in you're sick, you know. So we are the true, the Hindu nationalists are the true secularists, and you are simply secular. You know? uh, and that shows the interesting way in which the, the term is accepted. Um, uh, it, it has a kind of universal currency. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, so what is it all about then? Uh, I mean, I think the Indian debate uh, about secularism is in fact a debate about a plurality of social relations. It's not about a metaphysical distinction or an incommensurable relationship between what is religious and what is non-religious. Even the way the word secularism is used, as I've tried to uh, illustrate, uh, tells you um, that this is the case. So we know, for instance, that secularism was never initially part of the Indian constitution. Uh, indeed, when the Prime Minister Nehru was asked about it, he refused. Um, he thought that if you put secularism into the Indian constitution, it would simply be in order to accuse other people of not being secular enough. Mm -hmm. um, it has never been a line of separation, in other words. Uh, Akhil Bilgrami, who teaches here at Columbia University, has made this argument very nicely. India did not require official secularism because it didn't have a history like the history of Western Europe with the struggle of church and state, um, uh, and there was no religious civil war in India. Right? Uh, certain people might need secularism and other people might not. Um, Historically, it is not required. Secularism gets put into the Indian constitution by the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1976, along with socialism. And the politics of that is something quite different um, um, and has very little to do with the foundations of the Indian Republic. So Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, I've left him the best for last year, um, like Iqbal, was not concerned about the distinction of religion from non-religion. Like Iqbal, he was concerned by the loss of the ideal or the spiritual from public life. So his task was to put together, if you will, religion and non-religion in order to make idealistic and moral relations possible. Relations that he thought uh, that a public materialistic world uh, organized only around, around transactions over property disallowed. All right. And let me give you an example of that. 
So first, uh, you know, a kind of a nice example, a funny example that Gandhi himself gives in his 1909 manifesto, Hind Swaraj, uh, where he describes um, and castigates lawyers such as himself. All right? Now, what's the problem with lawyers? The problem with lawyers is that not only are they products of the colonial state, uh, they legitimize the colonial state, but their task is to separate people from each other and to make sure that Indians, individual Indians, of all faiths, castes, and classes, languages, etc., cetera, um, religions, can only relate to each other through the state. The state, the colonial state, serves as a third party, a neutral arbiter, a third party that gives meaning to these people, whoever they happen to be. Gandhi is much disturbed by this fact. He thinks that whether it's categories of caste or categories of community, religious community, they are given meaning in this way as interest groups, right? And defined, therefore, in property terms because their religion, therefore, gets to be their property. Just like in the Pakistani courts, the religion of Islam gets to be the property of the Pakistani people, the Muslim people of Pakistan. Right? Gandhi thinks this is very uh, disturbing. Um, uh, he thinks that divisions between people are fomented, whether deliberately or simply structurally, by the state, whether it's a colonial state or the modern state uh, uh, more generally. So how do you, in fact, um, try to get beyond this problem? Uh, because, of course, if the state acts as a third party and determines individual or groups of Indian citizens or subjects, in the case of colonial India, as being interest groups, then you really have lost the possibility of idealism in public life. And you could not have the freedom of India, you could not have Indian nationalism without that. Indian nationalism could not be uh, a successful enterprise if it was not idealistic, if it did not have a moral imperative, if it was simply about transactions. If it was simply about transactions, then Gandhi argued in this very book, in Swaraj, then you would accept the British. You would like them because, after all, they keep the peace. They give you uh, material goods. Interest, the category of interest, is one that actually ties Indians to colonialism. It doesn't, self-interest can as much link Indians to their uh, colonial rulers as separate them. So it's an insufficient category. And the transactions upon which ideas of interest are based are insufficient. Um, so what he does then is to think about the possibility of disinterest in public life. And disinterest can only be, or one of the ways in which it can be um, inculcated in public life is precisely through what might be called, in other contexts, religion. Right. So let me give you this example I was telling you about, and then I'll end very quickly. So just after the First World War, uh, in which the German but also the Ottoman Empire was defeated, Indian Muslims uh, set up a kind of movement in favor of the Ottoman Sultan, who they thought was the caliph, right? the khalifa, uh, the titular or symbolic leader of Muslims, or at least all Sunni Muslims. Uh, and they set up a kind of movement on his behalf um, to preserve the caliphate, which, is a, which appears to be a really paradoxical thing, right? Here are a bunch of British subjects who have apparently nothing to do with the Ottoman Empire, and they have um, um, uh, put forward this movement. They come to Gandhi and ask Gandhi to lead it. So here is a lovely situation in which the largest pan-Islamist uh, agitation or movement in history was led by a Hindu, right? Uh, he accepts, Gandhi accepts the leadership of the Khilafat movement. Why does he do it? Uh, not, I would argue, simply for you know, uh, out of political chicanery in order to gain the support of Muslims, uh, you know, and therefore, you know, uh, present a greater threat to British rule in India, which is how historians have normally conceptualized this or thought about this event. What he does is say, look, the thing about the Muslim demand, but what is good about it is that it is, as it were, irrational. It is purely idealistic. They're not gaining anything out of it, even if they succeed, all right? It's a purely idealistic and religious, therefore, movement. And precisely because it is what it is, if Hindus attach themselves to it, they too will idealize their politics. All right? um, the Muslim leaders come to Gandhi and say, look, if you support us, we, we promise to abjure cow slaughter because we know cow slaughter is offensive. 
to many Hindus, and therefore we will abjure it. And Gandhi says, on no account will you abjure cow slaughter, because this cannot be a contractual relationship. That kind of relationship is the relationship that is appropriate to the world of neutral third party states, interest groups, divide and rule, materialism, etc. The whole point of this movement is to get beyond that world. How do you do that? He says, Hindus will therefore support Muslims not for a deal. A deal cannot make a nation. Nations are not founded on, on uh, contractual arrangements. They're founded upon an ideal, fundamentally. Right? The Khilafat provides us one opportunity to mobilize on the basis of an ideal. And the, ab the abjuring of cow slaughter does the same. All right? And indeed, these Muslim leaders um, um, promised to and did abjure cow slaughter. So on the great feast of sacrifice in Delhi, there, was, there were no, in that year, no cow slaughter. This experiment, of course, does not last forever, as we know. But I invoke it because it's so interesting, uh, not only as a precedent for future movements, but also because it shows you the way in which uh, Indian political figures and uh, intellectuals think about the issue of secularism, though not necessarily in the name of the secular. Uh, so here is Gandhi heading up a Muslim movement uh, for the caliphate uh, and refusing to make a contractual arrangement with, with his fellow Indian uh, subjects, Muslims, um, and in the process, um, making available the possibility of the banning or the voluntary renunciation of cow slaughter, all without any kind of deal-making, apparently. Right. Um, how do you separate what's religion from non-religion here? How do you separate what's Hindu from Muslim here? Uh, can this not actually serve as a great example of Indian secularism rather than as an example of the theological in public life? Um, it is precisely the indifference of the relationship between what is religion and what is non-religion in this example, as in many others, that therefore, I think, defines at least in some ways, what we call Indian secularism. Now, I'd like to end then uh, by saying that if I have tried to lay out very schematically uh, a kind of comparison or contrast between an Indian history and typification of the secular or the problem of secularism and something that you might call European secularism, I've not done so in order to say the Indian one is better than the European one, uh, but only in order to illustrate how we might think about the secular and its apparent crisis in a more productive way, uh, that the stakes are not necessarily the ones we think about, that the return of religion might be a false return, uh, that the absence of the metaphysical or the vanishing of religion might be the true crisis that we are um, dealing with. Um, that the crisis of secularism in colonial, colonial times might be linked to the crisis of sovereignty or the inability, the unavailability of sovereign power uh, for colonized peoples. Today in Europe, uh, the crisis of secularism I think is also linked, uh, as the French scholar Olivier Roy argues, to the crisis of sovereignty in the European Union. You know, here is a system um, of governance which has no sovereignty built into it, um, even though it has a currency and all the rest. Um, and it's in this context that these anxieties, Roa argues, over what it is to be French, what it is to be Swiss, you know, uh, uh, what does it mean to be German, uh, take their energy from, um, and the religion, especially Islam, comes to inform these uh, debates and these controversies, uh, even though the uh, context uh, that they have meaning in appears to be hidden in full sight, um, that, the, 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 that there is an uh, absolute link between the crisis of the European Union and the so-called crisis of secularism, um, just as there was between the absence of sovereignty in, in colonial India uh, and the problem that religion 
post uh, for it um, there. So I will end there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I'm told that I should field questions, and I'm, there are microphones. Very interesting uh, lecture. I'm Sadaf Jaffer. I'm a postdoc in South Asian Studies at Princeton University. And my question is about the theological versus the non-theological. Uh, I was very interested in these examples you provided of Muslims using non-theological, what you term to be non-theological arguments, like a contractual or based on European uh, blasphemy law. And I was wondering about the history, if you think that there's a history of the theological and non-theological, and what would count as an actual theological argument as opposed to this kind of contractual or capitalistic argumentation. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, I think, um, you know, I recently read something in um, a kind of web forum website called Mufta, which is on Muslim issues. And it was by a woman uh, who was inveighing against the fact that all the arguments about hijab in this country and in Western Europe um, seem to lack all theological, you know, they, they, they might begin with theology, that is to say, you know, God told us to do it and all the rest, and then they quickly move on to uh, discussions about the right of women to wear what they want uh, and, um, you know, that, you know, the, the, the issue of patriarchy and the oppression of women is not necessarily relevant to the wearing of hijab, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, so, you know, her point was that uh, the loss of theology happens precisely when um, uh, debates about ostensibly religious uh, behavior um, um, occur. I found that fascinating. Um, now, I'm not arguing that this happens all the time and everywhere. Uh, you would have to look at, I mean, I think, for instance, and there are people in this audience better able than I am to discuss this, but if you were to look at uh, Iran, uh, you know, there you do seem to have a kind of theological uh, reasoning, which doesn't mean that it, it, it's sort of irrational and has nothing to do with, uh, you know, with everyday life as is understood elsewhere, but that it has its own integrity. Um, whereas um, with many of these other issues, uh, the religious or theological element seems to sink down and simply lend the name. All right? And that, I think, happens precisely when Islam becomes a kind of form of property, um, uh, as is the case in these uh, issues I described, whether it's the Ahmadi issue or the issue of um, the, the name, the use of Allah as a proper name in, in, in Indonesia or in Malaysia. Um, so I think that really is the crisis um, uh, that we see before us. Uh, I don't really know of any instances where you have a kind of re theology theologization happening. Um, but perhaps, you know, the, one of the examples I offer from Iqbal is a way of thinking about other possibilities. Uh, because when describing, um, you know, the, the sort of temporal way in which you might consider the relationship of religion and non-religion, or of uh, divine authority and human freedom, as he would name it, name that relationship, um, the, the um, the space of human freedom is embedded within a language that you might otherwise think of as religious um, and has a kind of esoteric, if you will, reality within it, but it is fully accepted. So he doesn't, um, he doesn't uh, subscribe to um, even the need for a distinction. It's another kind of logic that he's interested, that of the exoteric and of the esoteric, that of the outward and that of the inner. Um, and we normally think of the inner as being the realm of the spiritual and the religious and all the rest. For Iqbal, the inner is the realm of, the, of human freedom. Um, and freedom from God, not least. All right. Hi, I'm Pepe Carmel from NYU. Uh, thank you for this dazzling and also extremely complex argument and 
I wanted to try to extract what seemed to be an idea running through it and, and see if, if I've gotten it right. It, it seemed to me that to some extent you are saying that the, the common assumption that uh, ethnic conflict and so forth coalesces around religious issues is in fact backwards. That there are ethnic conflicts that emerge and then groups seize on religion or in, invent their own fundamentalisms to justify the conflicts they're having. I, is that what you're saying? And if so, what is the spur? I mean, we've seen an extraordinary rise in ethnic conflicts in the last 30 or 40 years. Do you have any sense of why this has happened? Well, I would, I would rephrase that and I would say that it's not that people are simply pretending and using religious language and doing non-religious things, but in fact that there is a huge desire for a yearning almost for what I'm calling crudely the theological or what Iqbal might call the metaphysical. Um, and yet it's very difficult to get. Uh, so, you know, the, the examples I just gave to the the previous question of you know the hijab and all the rest there's a realization that something of, that something wrong has happened you know that there's there's a big problem here and that islam uh, is simply apparently being sucked into a kind of liberal cap slash capitalist uh, world in which it's, it can be commodified all right and um, uh, now that's not only true of islam it could be true for other religions as well and i think it's the yearning or the desire uh, both on the part of the, if you will, secularists uh, who, re who require that to exist in order for their, distinctive, their distinction between religion and non-religion to even have reality. So Michel Houlebecq really wants the return of some kind of um, uh, metaphysical, if you will, theological certitude uh, in France. Um, and for the, if you will, non-secularists. So they are joined in this strange desire uh, the yearning for the metaphysical, which appears never to materialize. How could it? Uh, and perhaps the only way in which to deal with such a situation or such a question is by resort, as Iqbal did, to the theological. Uh, because already someone like Iqbal is uh, a post-metaphysical thinker. You know, he's, he's writing in the wake of Nietzsche's idea of the death of God, and he's a great admirer of Nietzsche. Right? So he has to think about these things differently that there's no possibility of returning to anything. But how do you deal with the void? How do you deal with the, the non-presence of this, um, this thing, which doesn't even have a proper name to itself? So it can be called religion, it can be called the theological, it can be called metaphysics, as Iqbal does, um, uh, et cetera. So I think it's, the, it's not a kind of chicanery. It's not people are pretending or deluding themselves. I think it's a, a real search, a real yearning um, that is built around the crisis of the absence of religion um, for both the secularists and the, if you will, non or anti-secularists. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I'm Asir Rahman, a journalist from India. The RSS political project in India is also ostensibly based on the attainment of an ideal uh, of, of Hindu Rashtra or Ram Rajya. Uh, but of course, it, in, it includes the uh, exclusion, the violent ex exclusion of uh, a, a large section of the population of Muslims. So how would you characterize this, uh, 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 you know, the RSS movement in, t in terms of the ideal it uh, wants to achieve? As I said, it's a secular movement, as it would describe itself um, as also. Uh, whether you look at, if, if you look at someone like Savarkar, uh, sort of one of the great father figures of the RSS, he's very, and I'm not saying anything new here, you know, he's not interested in Hinduism as a religion. Uh, he, in fact, thinks that Hinduism is a religion, knowing as we do that religion is a category you know, manif uh, that comes into being at a certain point in, in, in Western Europe and America, etc. I'll take that as given. Um, he thinks that Hindu religion is actually a problem uh, for Hindu nationality. And the whole point is how do you actually translate that into something that can give substance to, the, to uh, Hinduism as a nationality and as a majoritarian nationality. <laughs> 
Uh, and so the, the endeavor there seems to be to the, 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 what's constantly threatening to undo the RSS project is precisely Hinduism. You know, it's, you, how do you deal with this? You take the name, but he doesn't even want to take the name. As you know, he rejects Hinduism for Hindutva, you know, Hinduness. Uh, so if your big problem is in fact not necessarily Muslims, it's Hinduism itself, then you, know, you are in trouble. You need to somehow refigure it uh, so as to make it a purely majoritarian entity in which religious people might be included here and there, uh, but as long as the hierarchy is clear. Right? And it's not just it's, it's Hinduism, of course, that's a problem, but it's caste society also that is a problem for the RSS. Uh, uh, so its problems are many and internal. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily see it only in terms of a Hindu-Muslim um, conflict, though, of course, that is also there. Um, now, you started by mentioning its ideal, and that, of course, it's true enough that the ideal... Uh, it's also linked in some ways to Gandhi's ideal. You know Gandhi was assassinated by a man who had been a member of the RSS, Nathuram Godse. And very famously, Godse, uh, before assassinating Gandhi, bent down and touched his feet. And in his extraordinary um, uh, and lengthy statement in court when he's tried and then he's eventually executed, uh, says you know, how much he admired Gandhi and all that. Is. One of the reasons he admired him was this ability, apparently, of Gandhi's to harness the ideal. Right? Uh, so like Gandhi, whose emphasis was all on sacrifice, God says sacrifices himself. Uh, the man whom he hates, the man whom he kills, in killing him, he comes closest to him in many, obviously physically, but also, if you will, ideally. And that is fascinating. It shows you even uh, that even the RSS, which, as I said, is this kind of you know, a majoritarian force, which is secular, um, uh, can't quite escape the lure of what we might otherwise think of as being, oh, this is just Gandhi, Mr. Spiritual, mumbo-jumbo, and you know, it has no meaning today. It has, it has very great meaning, because you can't, do without that, uh, you can't do without the power of the ideal, which depends upon uh, sacrificial ethics and politics of the kind that Gandhi pioneered in India. <clears throat> My name is Gayatri Sinha. I'm a critic and a curator from Delhi. Uh, my, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My uh, question to you is, how do you view uh, secularism? Do you see it as a dynamic field? Uh, to take two of the propositions, for instance, the category of Islam and then the individual Gandhi, which you sort of pit in a kind of uh, a dyadic conversation. Um, if we are to see India as belonging cartographically to what can be seen as the great Muslim belt from West Asia all the way to Indonesia, and there is this uh, supposedly now increasingly majoritarian Hindu nation, um, would, that, would the secularism or the secular ideals of an, of an Iqbal or a Gandhi apply as late as 1989 when Rajiv Gandhi upholds the Shabano uh, judgment in a way which seems to bring about an end to Congress hegemony and lead, uh, at least electorally, to the rise of the right? Do you see then secularism as a dynamic category that unfolds because of electoral and other kinds of compulsions within the larger neighborhood? For instance, the rise of the Taliban, which seems to spook the Indian middle class into voting for the right. I would be interested in your response. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you very much. Yes, I think you're, I think you're quite right. And one of the reasons, well, let me give you two reasons for this. One, of course, is the fact that, as I've been trying to say, there is no dividing line. You know, it's a wavering line, as Raja Bhargava would say, uh, between what is religion and what is non-religion, however defined. Um, uh, and so it's always a kind of work in progress. It has a dynamism that is, of course, uh, defined by historical circumstances. Uh, so to turn to another example that I get, that of Lord Macaulay and his Indian Penal Code, you know, had Macaulay actually theologized and, and, uh, the, the Penal Code and made blasphemy a provision in it, introduced as it were the theological element in it, you might actually, it might, it might have been possible to minimize uh, the kind of violence that is perpetrated in religious terms or in the name of religion. The thing about hurt sentiments is that they are so expansive and so ambiguous that they can go everywhere. 
And so it's the, it's the, the wavering nature, both of the dividing line, uh, but also of the, what I'm calling the indifferent relationship between religion and non-religion that makes both uh, what I'm describing as Indian secularism possible, but also allows for the, um, allows for it to be shifted in a very violent direction. I think what you said earlier about um, uh, India in the midst of this um, world, though of course this world and the idea of the Muslim world is um, a, a quite recent invention, um, is interesting. It's, I mean, you just have to look in, at the way in which in popular culture um, events fr in the, from this world play out in India. You mentioned Taliban, um, and to this day, you know, the idea of a Hindu Taliban uh, is, in, is in circulation. Um, uh, uh, those in, you know, in, in Mumbai, there's a, there's a part of Mumbai um, uh, near Chopati, which um, people co constantly complain has been taken over by vegetarian restaurants, and those people are called the Taliban. Uh, uh, so, you know, so in funny ways and not so funny ways, the, it's, it's, it's fascinating how the language of, if you will, global Islam circulates often in non, um, uh, in, in, in circumstances which have very little, if anything, to do with Muslims, Indian Muslims themselves. That is an interesting relationship. I would add another one there, um, which is the language of love. And, and I add this to return to Gandhi. Um, so if you were to look at, um, you know, recently, there was a controversial film called Padmavati uh, about um, uh, uh, an evil Muslim king who goes and conquers a Hindu kingdom uh, partly because he desires the queen, right? And she uh, sets herself alight. And it's a famous story. It's from a medieval uh, romance. Um, and it caused a huge controversy in India. Um, the Hindu nationalists didn't like it, and the secularists, as it were, didn't like it either uh, because it was seen as anti-Hindu by one side and anti-Muslim uh, by the other. Yet, if you look at the vocabulary in this film, as in many Bollywood films, and certainly in the song sequences, the language of love is almost entirely Muslim, whether it's between the Hindu king and his queen or, or whoever. And now, this is an inheritance of history, that for North India, the language of erotic love is explicitly marked as Muslim. It's often per Urdu or Persian. It's instances, you know, Shirin and Farhad and Layla and Majnu and all that, which are popular and commonplace come from a kind of, in quotes, Muslim world. So on the one hand, you have the Taliban slash Taliban. On the other hand, you have this um, uh, inheritance. Uh, and both of them can coexist, uh, often in a violent way. Uh, but it's a world, India's world, the world in which India exists, in other words, is one that, um, that has a manifold but also deeply ambiguous um, uh, a deeply ambiguous meaning in Indian society uh, to this day. So you can have um, uh, the entire range of um, um, jihadi, fundamentalist, uh, etc., vocabulary and categorization in India, whether deployed towards Muslims or, or others. And at the same time, you can have um, this other language, which goes unquestioned. And that's the interesting thing. And the reason why Gandhi is important, because it was this kind of reality that Gandhi was so attentive to. You know, it was this uh, that he might describe as the, the, the language of the ideal or of the non-instrumental. Um, and it was in order to harness or mobilize uh, uh, this language, not to recover it, because it already exists. It is our historical inheritance. It doesn't have to be dragged back from the past. Uh, it's, in order to do, it's, it's in order to do that um, that, um, um, that the work of um, the secular is so um, crucial. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Devji, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Raja Kartike. I work with the UN. Uh, I was wondering, uh, uh, based on what you said about uh, you know, how uh, the word secular fits so uncomfortably, frankly, in the case of India, whether the Indian state should even be you know, called secular if it is so far away. There is, the word does not translate easily into any Indian language. Uh, the Indian state is, by that definition, the Western definition of the word, is not secular. It subsidizes uh, 
uh, pilgrimages for Hajj. Mm -hmm. It subsidizes pilgrimages mm -hmm. for the Hindus to Kailash. Mm -hmm. And in my state, there was even a proposal to subsidize pilgrimages for Christians to travel to Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a sta the state controls the revenues of uh, temples. They pretty much, you know, everything goes into the government's coffers. So in what way uh, is this even sustainable, firstly? Uh, so is it be better perhaps for the Indian state to go away from this uh, whatever paradoxical you know, definition and go back to the, 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 the more like definition of the word secular uh, and stay away from uh, interference in intervention, let's say, uh, in all religious matters altogether? No. Can I add a question to this? It, it is related. Uh, I was also, my name is Dapati Guha Thakutta. Uh, I was, I found your lecture really fascinating, but I was troubled in a way by the way you almost seem to absolve Indian secularism in a way of being, remaining secular in a way that many of the other subcontinental countries have avoided. And I'm raising this because while you're absolutely right that political Hindutva is not religious Hinduism, no. But I would really uh, f stop from calling it secular in any sense, mm. because in the name of majoritarianism, those of us who are secular are also made minor minoritarian in a way. And there's a way in which being secular is seen as an indoctrination of a Western ideological system. And therefore, being secular is also being anti-national. And this has become a huge debate in the current context, where then a certain notion of a Hindu majoritarian nation is positing the secular. And this is a crisis of the 80s and 90s. And therefore, the impasse of secularism and the crisis of secularism, the poverty of secularism, because it's not able to address the religion at all, is, I think, a very, very strong one. And it reflected itself in, the, in of course, the destruction of the Babri Masjid. When, and the left secular was left trying to disprove the remains of a mm. temple, rather than to say a mosque deserved to be a protected monument, right? So I therefore wanted to say that it perhaps there is a huge impoverishment of what we understand mm. as the secular that is taken up from the Nehruvian moment to the current. So that is one small point I thought it needs to be said that even though, yes, there is a larger way in which everybody can be secular, there's a distinct way in which the exclusionism and particularly the othering of the Muslims and many others who are against this notion of the Hindu Rashtra are being rendered into minoritarianism. So I thought that would be important. And the other small point was really about the moment with which you began, which is artists turning to the religious. Yeah. I'd like to make a fine distinction here between the artist's claims on iconography as against the religious. Mm. And I think it's important to put it out there. Because Hussein always said that all of India's iconography was his, but mm. without it being religious. So is there a subtle distinction in the 50s to be made mm. by turning to myth and iconography as against thinking of the religious? Yes, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I mean, I would say with the first question, what you describe, of course, is the very thing that um, Rajiv Bhargava would call uh, a politics of principle different, a principle, uh, principled uh, distance. That is to say, if you are going to fund uh, Hindu pilgrimages, you will also fund Muslim ones. If you, so be, precisely because there's no singular um, in, uh, line, unmoving line drawn between what's the religion and what's the non-religion, it can shift in all kinds of ways. So you may be right. It might have shifted too much in one direction because, of course, you are correct that the state you know, has representatives. It sits on the boards of temples. It controls things. Um, and that this mode of toleration and, indeed, support is also a form of state control of religion. Um, and we see, at, at least for Muslims, some diminution in this logic because, of course, the subsidies for Hajj are meant to be um, eradicated, um, uh, uh, and those for other religious occasions may or you know uh, may not be as well. 
So I think the problem is with the, as I was saying in response to another earlier question, the problem is with the, the wavering nature of the line or the, the, the refusal to draw a strong line, uh, a refusal that is premised upon a set of criticisms that I, some of which I tried to describe in my lecture, um, whose arguments I think are compelling, if not necessarily complete. Uh, so now you have to deal with the problem posed by Indian secularism uh, in its own terms. So, you know, where does that wavering line, where does it, um, uh, where can it be drawn? You know, is it too far, is it too little? But those are internal debates. Those, those are not debates that uh, put into question the structure of the argument itself. And they can be made, so you can, uh, you can decide, as has been done with the Hajj, that you're not going to fund this stuff any longer. And that doesn't really alter the, if you will, the secular uh, vision or order uh, itself. Now, the problem, of course, is, as Tapati was saying, the, the, um, uh, this way of conceiving of the secular opens it to a, a range of um, often violent possibilities. And one reason why I was, so in, I was so insistent that the RSS in response to that question was secular is precisely in order to make that point uh, that there is a great deal of danger embedded in this idea of the secular. Uh, there are many kinds of possibilities uh, that exist in it. Uh, so I didn't want to take the easy road in saying, you know, the RSS claims to be secular, but in fact it's religious. And so, you know, we can preserve secularism in its ideal form uh, by simply excluding it. Uh, what I wanted to do is say, no, what, what, does, what do things look like if we accept the RSS at its word and say that it's secular? then we are forced to think about secularism in its diversity and in its ambiguity. And I think maybe that is a task that needs to be done. Um, as for the, the um, I mean, so I would go, so, uh, I would say, for instance, that when Indira Gandhi put secularism to the Constitution, uh, her father had wisely left it out. Uh, that is one, Point. It's not a point of origin, but it's one uh, constitutional legal point um, which redefines the debate. Because suddenly the resort is to a specific uh, constitutional provision. Um, it alters the debate uh, in many ways. I have not done the research on it, but I would hazard a guess that this is uh, that we can actually look at 1976 and what happens afterwards, and it. It, provide, it, it gives the violence that occurs after that period a different kind of institutional, legal, juridical, et cetera, meaning. Um, uh, so, I, you know, so you don't have to just posit a kind of endless uh, history, endless trajectory of communal violence in India. About the iconography, yes, I agree. I mean, I haven't studied this in any, at all, uh, in any depth at all. It's just that I've been struck by the use of these often violent forms of in quotes, religious uh, imagery in, in modern Indian art. I mean, again, the question of ownership, which um, I was pointing to in my lecture, comes up with Hussein, of course, because as we know, uh, he's eventually uh, forced out of the country. Uh, and the, the um, ostensible cause is his painting of Hindu goddesses. Uh, now, whereas much f uh, attention is focused upon the, the the erotic nature or the nude Hindu goddess figure, I wonder if, just like with the Muslim examples I was giving, whether it's not actually also a case of uh, laying claim to property. That how can a Muslim artist paint this? Um, you know, this is not his to paint. Um, just like Christians in, in Indonesia cannot use the word Allah. So, I, I, so I'll end there. I see Bunhu looking at me. One more? One more? Okay. Uh, Faisal, thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, uh, you mentioned the interpenetration of um, 
religion and non-religion throughout and the non-dualism that you mentioned. But surely that existed, um, uh, has existed, you know, uh, through all time. And surely also something changed with the Enlightenment and with the introduction of institutionalized science. And um, so uh, it seemed, um, as the previous question asked, you seem to have obliterated a space for a truly secular uh, practice uh, by allowing for this interpenetration to become mm. a kind of universal thing. Mm. Um, and so there must be a distinction one can draw between, the pre between pre-enlightenment and post-enlightenment uh, interpenetration of uh, science and uh, secular and religion, Sec secularism and religion. Yes, no, thank you. Um, you're right that uh, there may well have been, I'm sure there was, a kind of pre-modern history of what we might call in post-enlightenment uh, um, terms, religious, interreligious relations. Uh, but my focus, of course, was on the post-enlightenment um, history of these relations. What was inherited from the past, I can't say. I'm sure it was something. Uh, but, of course, transformed entirely uh, by the time you get to the late 19th and into the 20th centuries. So the reason why I didn't bring the pre-modern up was uh, not simply because I work on modern India, but also because I was... I was intent on thinking about the problem in modern or contemporary, even contemporary terms. Uh, and I was not so interested in tracing a, a pre-modern inheritance, uh, not to say that it doesn't exist. So in that sense, there was a gap, there was an elision from my talk because I didn't take that into consideration because I wanted to see how we can reconsider this problem in our terms, 20th and 21st century terms. Um, that would be another kind of project, though I entirely agree with you um, that there, there may well be a link. Um, and the other reason I did not want to make the link, of course, was because then one gets into an entirely other set of, of debates of what is inherited and what is not inherited and what is recuperable and what is not recuperable and what is authentic and what is not authentic. Um, now, I... As to your latter point, which, which um, um, takes up from where Tapati, uh, which joins Tapati's um, uh, question or criticism is, I, I agree uh, that uh, you cannot certainly today look upon this situation, the, the history or character of Indian ses, uh, secularism with equanimity. You know, it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, so, you know, I want to, that is presupposed, that is given. Uh, what I'm interested in doing is to, rather than preferring solutions to that big problem, which is too big for easy solutions, is rather to, to suggest that we might think about the problem slightly differently. Uh, that, and we can do that by seeing how an Indian thinker like Iqbal uh, understood European or Western secularism and criticized it, and how another Indian thinker like Gandhi thought about um, difference and interreligious relations uh, in the uh, middle of the 20th century. Uh, these are just simply two cases of um, two examples of the way in which we might begin to think about the debate on the crisis of secularism and the return of religion slightly differently than the way we are uh, conventionally used to doing so. Thank you.